As the sun sets on the landscapes of our ancestors, the silent whisper of death ushers in a tale of the departed, a narrative sculpted by time, tradition, and the macabre fascination of civilizations with those who have passed. Imagine the Colosseum in its prime, circa 80 in the year of the Lord, echoing with the roars of a crowd as a gladiator falls, his body left to the sands or claimed for rites that may honor or condemn him in death. These warriors, often slaves, met their end with a spectacle, their bodies sometimes disposed of without ceremony, or, if fortunate, given to the earth with rites that spoke of respect and remembrance. Venture then to the rooftop of the world, to Tibet, where the sacred practice of sky burial offers a stark contrast. Here, in the thin, cold air, the dead are offered back to the earth, their bodies skillfully disassembled and left on mountaintops for vultures to consume. Then, amidst the enlightenment and shadows of 19th century Paris, the morgue became an unlikely attraction. Here, the bodies of the unidentified or unclaimed were displayed behind glass for the public to view, drawing crowds as if it were a macabre exhibition. As we embark on this somber journey through the rites and rituals of death, we are reminded of the words of the Roman philosopher Seneca, death is the wish of some, the relief of many, and the end of all. Can we truly comprehend the myriad ways in which cultures honor the dead? Or is the essence of these practices as elusive as the boundary between life and death itself? Join us as we delve into the enigmatic world of the dead, exploring the final rites and curious traditions that have accompanied those on their journey to the afterlife. Welcome to the diary of Julius Caesar. Eternal Arena, the afterlife of Rome's gladiators. In the heart of ancient Rome, the Colosseum stood as a testament to the empire's grandeur and its complex relationship with death. Within its vast, echoing walls, gladiators, slaves, prisoners of war and volunteers alike fought valiantly, often to their last breath, for the amusement of the populace and the favor of the emperors. The spectacle of gladiatorial combat, a dance with death under the sun-drenched sky or beneath the glow of torchlight, was more than mere entertainment. It was a ritual steeped in religious significance, a display of martial valor, and a reflection of the societal order. Yet, the conclusion of these bloody ballets raised a somber question. What became of the fallen gladiators, those who paid the ultimate price in the sand-strewn arena? The fate of these warriors after their final battle was as meticulously organized as their life in the Ludus, the gladiator school. Contrary to the popular belief, that all gladiators met their end in the arena, many did survive, though often bearing the scars of their encounters. For those less fortunate, their exit from the stage of combat was governed by rituals and roles specifically designated for such moments. The figure central to this post-mortem procession was the Libitinarius, named after Libitina, the Roman goddess of funerals and burial. This individual, or sometimes a group of people, was responsible for removing the bodies of the deceased from the arena. Dressed in the garb of Mercury, the messenger of the gods, and armed with a hot iron, the Libitinarius would prod the fallen to ensure death, mimicking Mercury's role as the conductor of souls to the afterlife. Once confirmed, the body would be carried away through the Porta Libitinensis, aptly named as the Gate of Death, which served as a one-way passage from the world of the living to the realm of the dead. The procession led by the Libitinarius to the Spoliarium, a term derived from the Latin spolium, meaning the spoils of war, was a journey from the public eye to the privacy of death. Here, in the shadowed confines away from the Colosseum's grandeur, the bodies were stripped of their armaments and any personal adornments. This practice mirrored the rituals of ancient Roman warfare, where the spoils were collected and displayed as symbols of victory. It is in this context that the poet Juvenal's words resonate, the people that once bestowed commands, consulships, legions, and all else, now meddles no more and longs eagerly for just two things, bread and circuses. This quote underscores the societal importance of the games as a means of appeasement and distraction, highlighting the depth of the spectacle's influence on Roman life. The disposal of these bodies varied, some, particularly those of renown or noble birth, 
might be claimed by family or friends for a proper funeral. Others, however, found their final resting place in the graveyards that dotted the outskirts of Roman cities, places designated for slaves and non-citizens. These sites, often lacking the pomp and circumstance of patrician burials, still offered a semblance of dignity in death, a far cry from the ignoble end one might expect for those who perished for entertainment. Inscriptions and epitaphs found in such graveyards offer a glimpse into the lives and deaths of these combatants, with some marked by expressions of respect and mourning from those they left behind, while some, like the revered gladiator Spartacus, who led the infamous slave rebellion in 73-71 BC, remained unclaimed due to their status as enemies of the state, others received more honored disposals. One poignant example is the gravestone of a gladiator named Flammer, who, despite being offered the rudis, the wooden sword symbolizing freedom, four times, chose to remain in the arena. His epitaph proudly proclaims his victories, his choice to fight on, and his eventual resting place among his fallen brethren. Roman writers, from Seneca to Cicero, commented on the gladiatorial games with a mix of fascination and horror, reflecting the complex emotions these spectacles evoked. Seneca, in his letters to Lucilius, described witnessing the games firsthand, expressing his dismay at the crowd's bloodlust. He who fights with monsters should be careful lest he thereby become a monster. And if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss will also gaze into you. Marshall's epigrams, on the other hand, celebrate the valor and prowess of the arena's champions, immortalizing their deeds in verse and offering a stark contrast to Seneca's moral apprehensions. The gladiators of ancient Rome, even in death, were never forgotten. Their bodies, once instruments of their trade, were treated with a mixture of reverence and practicality, reflecting the multifaceted views of Roman society on death and the afterlife. While the sands of the arena have long since been swept away, the stories of these ancient warriors, how they lived, fought, and were remembered after their final battle, continue to captivate and haunt the annals of history. Eternal Journey, the art and soul of Egyptian mummification. In the heart of ancient Egypt, amidst the timeless sands and monumental pyramids that pierced the horizon, thrived a civilization deeply entwined with the mysteries of the afterlife. Central to their quest for eternity was the sophisticated practice of mummification, a ritual as much a science as it was a spiritual journey designed to preserve the body against the ravages of time. This elaborate process, perfected over millennia, was not merely about death, but a profound testament to life, belief, and the enduring soul. The origins of Egyptian mummification trace back to the earliest dynasties, around 3000 BCE, with its techniques evolving into an art form by the time of the New Kingdom, around 1550 to 1070 BCE. The Egyptians believed in an afterlife where the dead lived on, their existence paralleling that on Earth, but in a divine realm. For such a journey, the preservation of the body was crucial. It was thought that the spiritual elements of a person, their ba, soul, and ka, spiritual essence, required a physical vessel to return to, ensuring immortality. The process began with the purification of the body, washing it with water from the sacred Nile. The removal of internal organs followed, with the liver, lungs, stomach, and intestines carefully extracted and placed in canopic jars, each protected by one of the four sons of Horus. The heart, believed to be the seat of wisdom and emotion, was typically left within the body, deemed essential for the final judgment by Osiris, the god of the afterlife. Perhaps the most recognized step in the mummification process was the dehydration and preservation of the body using natron, a naturally occurring salt mixture. This desiccation phase, lasting about 40 days, was critical to preventing decay. Following this, embalmers skillfully wrapped the body in hundreds of meters of linen, interspersed with amulets and charms to protect the deceased in their journey. The Book of the Dead, a collection of spells and prayers, often accompanied the mummy, guiding the deceased through the dangers of the underworld. The case of Ramses II, 1279 to 1213 BCE, whose mummy reveals the skill of ancient embalmers, highlights the effectiveness of these methods. Over 3,000 years later, 
the pharaoh's features remain recognizable, a silent witness to the meticulous care of his embalmers. Prominent figures, such as pharaohs and nobility, received the most elaborate mummification, reflecting their status and the wealth they could devote to achieving immortality. The discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922 by Howard Carter revealed the pinnacle of mummification artistry and the lengths to which the ancient Egyptians went to secure the afterlife for their kings. The young pharaoh's body, adorned with a golden mask and surrounded by treasure, lay in a series of nested coffins, each more intricate than the last. Mummification was not reserved for the elite alone. Variations of the practice were accessible to those of lesser means. The level of care and complexity in the mummification process mirrored the deceased's social status and their family's resources. However, the underlying belief in the afterlife and the need for a preserved body united all classes in ancient Egyptian society. The Fayum mummy portraits, for instance, reveal a blend of Egyptian and Roman burial practices, illustrating the widespread adoption and adaptation of mummification across different periods and cultures within Egypt. The practice of mummification, steeped in religious significance, also reflected the ancient Egyptians' deep connection to their environment. The use of natron from the desert, resins and oils from local plants, and the reliance on the Nile's life-giving waters exemplify their harmony with the natural world. This connection is epitomized in the words of the ancient Egyptian sage Ptahhotep, who advised, follow the heart as long as you live, a reminder of the values that guided Egyptian life and death. Spectres of Paris, the macabre lure of the 19th century morgue. In the heart of 19th century Paris, amidst the grand boulevards and bustling cafes, lay an attraction that drew the curious, the morbid, and the just plain bored, the morgue. This peculiar institution, situated on the Ile de la Cité near Notre Dame, transformed the somber affair of death into a public spectacle, offering a window into the city's darker undercurrents. The Paris morgue, established in its most famous form in 1864, became a testament to the era's fascination with death and the macabre, a place where the anonymous dead were displayed behind glass for the public to view. The practice of displaying the unidentified dead was initially intended as a method for facilitating identification by friends or family. However, it quickly evolved into a form of entertainment and voyeurism, attracting thousands of visitors daily. The morgue's allure was not lost on travellers either, with guidebooks of the time often listing it alongside the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower as a must-see attraction. The spectacle was free, the doors were open to all, and the display was ever-changing, with the bodies replaced frequently to make room for new unfortunates. The tableau presented to visitors was macabre, yet meticulously arranged. The bodies, some fresh and others in various stages of decay, were laid out on marble slabs, cooled by a system of refrigeration to slow decomposition. A sheet of glass separated the spectators from the deceased, a barrier that did little to diminish the sense of intimacy with death. The scene was illuminated by a strategically placed skylight, casting a ghastly glow on the faces of the dead, enhancing the eerie spectacle. The phenomenon of the morgue as a tourist attraction speaks volumes about the societal attitudes towards death in 19th century Paris. It was a period marked by rapid change and upheaval, from the revolutions of 1848 to the Franco-Prussian War and the Commune de Paris. In such times, death was a constant presence, and the morgue offered a place to confront mortality in a manner that was both detached and intensely personal. The anonymous dead served as a mirror to the living, a silent commentary on the fragility of life and the anonymity of death in a bustling metropolis. One notable story involves the mysterious case of the unknown woman of the Seine, whose serene, enigmatic smile captivated both the public and artists of the time. Her body, displayed in the morgue in the late 1880s, never found an identity, but her visage went on to inspire countless works of art and literature, immortalizing her as a symbol of eternal mystery. The morgue also found its way into the literature and art of the period, reflecting its deep imprint on the cultural consciousness of Paris. 
Emile Zola, in his novel Thérèse Raquin, describes a visit to the morgue with a chilling accuracy that captures the morbid curiosity of the crowds and the stark reality of the displayed bodies. Charles Baudelaire, the poet of the macabre, alluded to the morgue in his works, drawing parallels between the beauty of the dead and the existential ennui of modern life. Anecdotes from the era abound, painting vivid pictures of the morgue's visitors. One tale tells of fashionable Parisian ladies, decked in their finery, strolling through the morgue as part of their afternoon promenade. Another recounts the story of a young man recognizing his fiancée among the displayed, a tragic event that underscores the morgue's role in the public's engagement with death. A famous quote attributed to Mark Twain during his visit to Paris captures the peculiar fascination with the morgue. The people have a wholesome curiosity to see for themselves what the semblance of death is like. This sentiment encapsulates the dual nature of the morgue's attraction. Part educational, part voyeuristic, it was a place where one could gaze upon death safely from a distance, yet feel its cold breath. The Paris morgue stands as a historical curiosity, a window into a period when the line between entertainment and morbidity was blurred and death became a spectacle. Its popularity waned as the century turned and societal attitudes towards death and the dignity of the deceased evolved. Yet for a time, it served as a stark reminder of the omnipresence of death in the city of life, a place where the anonymous dead whispered tales of the city's heart to those who would listen. On wings of freedom, the sacred cycle of Tibetan sky burials. High in the rugged, windswept plateaus of Tibet, a profound and sacred ritual unfolds that speaks to the heart of Buddhist philosophy and the Tibetan people's deep connection with the natural world. Known as sky burials, this ancient practice offers a final farewell to the departed, entrusting their physical form to the beaks of vultures in a direct and poignant return to the cycles of nature. This ritual, steeped in the Buddhist belief in the transience and impermanence of life, reflects a profound understanding of life's ephemerality and the interconnectedness of all beings. The origins of sky burials in Tibet are as ancient as they are shrouded in mystery, dating back centuries. The practice is rooted in Vajrayana Buddhism, which spread into Tibet from India in the 8th century. Sky burials are based on the principle of Jata, which translates to giving alms to the birds, a final act of generosity by the deceased, who offer their bodies as sustenance for the living. This ritual encapsulates the Buddhist teachings on impermanence, compassion, and the cycle of life and death, encouraging a detachment from the physical form. The sky burial begins with a ritual preparation that takes place far from the eyes of the uninitiated, often in designated locations known as charnel grounds. The body of the deceased is cleansed and wrapped in white cloth, then left to rest while lamas, Tibetan Buddhist monks, recite prayers and mantras, invoking the departure of the soul from the body. At dawn, the body is carried to the burial site, where the ritual master, or rogyapa, sometimes referred to as the body breaker, performs the task of disassembling the body, a process viewed not as an act of desecration, but as a final act of charity and compassion. In the desolate beauty of the charnel grounds, set against the backdrop of Tibet's stark mountains, the assembled vultures wait. The Rogyapa, with precise and respectful movements, prepares the body, ensuring that every part is accessible to the birds. This moment, when the vultures descend in a silent, solemn congregation to partake in the offering, is seen as the soul's liberation, its release from the bonds of the physical world to be reborn in accordance with the cycles of karma. The significance of the vulture in this ritual cannot be overstated. Regarded with reverence, these birds are considered dakinis, sky dancers that carry the departed to the heavens. Their acceptance of the body is seen as a good omen, indicating that the deceased's sins have been forgiven and that their soul has been freed from the cycle of samsara, the endless cycle of rebirth. Sky burials are not merely a funeral practice, but a profound expression of the Tibetan worldview, which sees death as a transition rather than an end. This perspective is encapsulated in the words of the Dalai Lama, who reflects on the nature of existence, 
this life is like a cloud that passes by. Sky burials thus become a physical manifestation of this philosophy, a ritual that visibly intertwines life and death, sorrow and liberation. Throughout the years, sky burials have attracted interest and misunderstanding in equal measure. To the Tibetan people, however, they are a sacred tradition, a private affair meant to honor the dead and the natural laws that govern existence. In recent times, measures have been taken to protect the sanctity of sky burials, restricting access to outsiders to preserve the ritual's integrity and dignity. Anecdotes of sky burials often highlight the profound emotional impact of the ritual on the bereaved, offering a cathartic release and a deep sense of peace, knowing that their loved ones have returned to the earth in the most altruistic way. The ritual, in its raw and unflinching acceptance of death, provides a powerful lesson on the impermanence of life, encouraging a deeper appreciation for the fleeting nature of existence. The words of the 14th Dalai Lama, our prime purpose in this life is to help others, and if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them, resonate with the spirit of the sky burial. Echoes of stillness, the Victorian era's memento mori. In the dimly lit parlors of the 19th century, amidst the rustle of black mourning crepe and the solemn toll of church bells, a poignant tradition took root in the Victorian heartland. This era, a tableau of contrasts where the advancements of the Industrial Revolution met a deeply ingrained preoccupation with the afterlife, gave rise to post-mortem photography. This practice, both haunting and tender, provided a bridge between the realms of the living and the departed, capturing the visages of loved ones in a final, eternal embrace. The inception of post-mortem photography in the early 1840s coincided with photography's nascent steps into the public consciousness. The daguerreotype, introduced by Louis Daguerre in 1839, offered the first practical means of capturing the human likeness, a magic mirror that seemed to freeze time itself. For families across Europe and America, these photographic mementos became cherished keepsakes, particularly in an era when death was a constant visitor, its shadow lingering over the young and old alike due to diseases like tuberculosis, which ravaged the population without regard for age or status. These memorial portraits often depicted the deceased in a state of peaceful repose, dressed in their finest attire as if merely asleep. A poignant example of this art form can be found in the portraits of children who were frequently photographed in their mother's arms or surrounded by their favorite toys, a heart-rending attempt to capture a semblance of life amidst the pallor of death. One notable photograph from this period is that of Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence and Avondale, Queen Victoria's grandson, who died in the influenza pandemic of 1889 to 1890. His post-mortem photograph, which shows him lying in state, reflects the royal family's adherence to this custom, underscoring its widespread acceptance across social strata. The photographers who specialized in these somber portraits became masters of illusion, employing various techniques to imbue the photographs with a lifelike quality. Stands and clamps were hidden beneath clothing to prop up the body, while artists might paint eyes onto the subject's closed eyelids or add a tint of color to the cheeks in the final print. In America, a photographer named Jeremiah Gurney gained renown for his skill in capturing the essence of the deceased, offering a semblance of comfort to families during their time of grief. The phenomenon of post-mortem photography was not limited to any one country. It was a practice that resonated deeply across the Atlantic, in both Europe and the United States. The American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, with its catastrophic loss of life, saw a surge in the demand for these mementos as families clung to the images of soldiers who would never return. One notable example of post-mortem photography is the portrait of President Abraham Lincoln's son, Willie, who died in the White House in 1862. The photograph, which depicts the young boy lying in repose, is a haunting reminder of the personal tragedies faced by public figures. Similarly, the photographs of the deceased members of the European aristocracy and American elite offer a glimpse into the universal nature of grief and the desire to hold on to those we have lost. One of the era's most famous quotes, attributed to Abraham Lincoln, 
touches on the weight of such losses. In this sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all, and to the young, it comes with bitterest agony because it takes them unawares. Anecdotes abound of families gathering for one last portrait with a departed member, a final act of unity in the face of separation. These images, for all their spectral stillness, speak volumes about the lives they commemorate, serving as a poignant reminder of the past's enduring presence. As the Victorian era gave way to the Edwardian and the world marched towards the 20th century, the practice of post-mortem photography began to fade. The advent of snapshot photography allowed for more spontaneous memories to be captured, shifting the cultural focus from death to life. Yet, the legacy of these post-mortem photographs endures, a testament to the human desire to hold on to those we love long after they have left us. Beneath the City of Lights, the shadowed labyrinth of the Paris catacombs. In the heart of Paris, beneath the bustling streets and vibrant life of the city, lies a somber world, a silent city of the dead known as the catacombs. This subterranean labyrinth, stretching over hundreds of kilometers, cradles the remains of over six million souls, making it one of the most haunting and fascinating ossuaries in the world. The creation of the catacombs in the late 18th century was a monumental project, born out of necessity and desperation, a response to the city's overflowing cemeteries and the health hazards they posed. The story of the catacombs begins in the late 1700s when Paris faced a critical public health crisis. The city's cemeteries, particularly Les Innocents, the oldest and largest cemetery, were overcrowded. Reports of decomposing matter infiltrating the local water supply and spreading disease forced King Louis XVI and the Parisian authorities to seek a solution. The decision was made to eliminate the problem at its root by exhuming the bodies and relocating them into the abandoned quarries beneath Paris. In 1786, the transfer began under the cover of night. The operation was shrouded in secrecy and reverence. A procession of black draped wagons carried the bones from the cemeteries to their new resting place. The first of the remains were moved to the catacombs on April 7, 1786, marked by a ceremony that consecrated the site under the name Municipal Ossuary, later to become known as the Catacombs, named after the Roman catacombs, which had inspired a similar sense of morbid fascination. The catacombs were not merely a burial site, but a meticulously planned mausoleum. The bones were arranged artistically with femurs and skulls forming walls, and other bones filling the space behind them. This arrangement was not done solely for practical reasons, but also served as a reminder of the equality of death, stripping away the distinctions of status, wealth and power that had divided these individuals in life. Among the labyrinthine corridors, one can find inscriptions, poems and quotes that ponder mortality and the human condition. A famous inscription at the entrance reads, Arrête, c'est ici l'Empire de la Mort. Stop, this is the Empire of Death. A solemn greeting to visitors that underscores the catacombs' dual role as both a burial site and a place of reflection on life's transient nature. The catacombs have also been a source of fascination and inspiration through the centuries. During the French Revolution, it is said that members of the Paris Commune used the tunnels as a hideout. Later in the 19th century, the catacombs captivated the imagination of writers and poets. Victor Hugo referenced this underground world in his novel Les Miserables, and it is rumored that Philippe Asper, a doorkeeper at the Val de Grasse Hospital, wandered into the catacombs in 1793 and was lost, his body not discovered until 11 years later, becoming part of the lore of the catacombs. Over the years, the catacombs have seen various uses from a clandestine meeting place for secret societies to a unique venue for concerts and events in the 19th century. Yet, the catacombs' primary role has always been as a monumental ossuary, a stark reminder of Paris's history and the ever-present shadow of death beneath the city's streets. The catacombs of Paris remain one of the city's most enigmatic and compelling attractions, drawing visitors from around the world eager to explore its dark corridors and reflect on the stories of the millions who rest within its walls. This subterranean ossuary, a product of Paris's tumultuous history, 
stands as a testament to the city's ability to reinvent itself, even in death, and continues to captivate the imagination of all who dare to venture beneath the City of Lights. Shadows beneath the soil, unearthing the Black Death's legacy. In the mid-14th century, Europe was enveloped in a shroud of death as the Black Death, a devastating pandemic caused by the bacterium asterisk Yersinia pestis asterisk swept across the continent. Between 1347 and 1351, it claimed the lives of an estimated 25 million people, up to a third of Europe's population at the time. The scale of the tragedy was unimaginable, with entire communities vanishing in the wake of the disease. In this grim era, the logistics of death became a morbid reality, as traditional burial practices were overwhelmed by the sheer number of victims. This led to the creation of plague pits and mass graves, which have since become a haunting legacy of the pandemic's toll. The Black Death's arrival in Europe was marked by ships docking at the port of Messina, Sicily in 1347, their crews either dead or dying from the plague. From there, the disease spread like wildfire, leaving cities, towns and villages grappling with an unprecedented mortality crisis. Traditional burial grounds quickly overflowed, necessitating the use of mass graves. These were often hastily dug on the outskirts of settlements or within monastic lands, where the bodies of the deceased could be interred en masse. In London, the situation was dire. The city's churchyards could no longer accommodate the dead, leading to the establishment of several emergency burial sites. One of the most notable was the East Smithfield Black Death Cemetery, established by royal decree. Archaeological excavations in the area have uncovered mass graves containing bodies stacked five deep, a reflection of the chaos and desperation of the time. Records from the time, including those from the Tower of London, indicate that this site alone may have been the final resting place for tens of thousands of Londoners, point to the rapid establishment of this site to accommodate the dead, with King Edward III issuing orders for its creation in 1348. Similarly, in other parts of Europe, such as Italy and France, the use of mass graves became a common practice. In Venice, for example, the island of Pavalia was designated as a plague quarantine station, where victims were taken to die and be buried in large pits. The island is said to contain the remains of over 100,000 people, making it one of the most chilling reminders of the plague's devastation. The discovery of these burial sites in the modern era has opened a window into the past allowing scientists and historians to piece together the puzzle of the Black Death. The excavation of a plague pit in Clermont-Ferrand, France, for example, revealed not just the bones of the deceased, but also a snapshot of life and death in the 14th century. Archaeologists and historians rely on a combination of historical documents, maps and contemporary accounts to locate these graves. Once identified, Careful excavation and analysis of the remains can reveal not only the cause of death, but also dietary habits, health conditions, and even the social status of the victims. One of the most significant findings from these sites is the presence of asterisk Yersinia pestis asterisk DNA, which has helped confirm the bacterial cause of the Black Death. Studies of teeth samples from skeletons in mass graves have been pivotal in understanding the spread and virulence of the disease. For instance, the analysis of remains from a mass grave in Barcelona, Spain, provided crucial data on the strain of the bacterium, shedding light on how the disease spread through Europe. Additionally, isotopic analysis of bones has shed light on the diets and origins of the victims, suggesting that the plague affected both locals and migrants living in urban centers. The ethical implications of excavating mass graves are complex, balancing the pursuit of knowledge with respect for the deceased. In places like the Plague Village of Iam in England, where the local population chose to quarantine themselves to prevent the spread of the disease, excavations are approached with particular sensitivity, mindful of the community's sacrifice and suffering. Among the anecdotes that bring the human element of this tragedy to life is the account of Agnolo di Tura, an Italian chronicler who wrote of the Black Death in Siena, Italy. He lamented, and so many died, that all believed it was the end of the world. This personal account, alongside others from the period, highlights the despair and helplessness 
felt by those who lived through the pandemic. As we uncover these layers of history, we are reminded of the words of Giovanni Boccaccio in The Decameron, who wrote of the plague, in the face of so much affliction and misery, all respect for the laws of God and man had broken down and been extinguished in our city. Sailing into eternity, the majestic Viking ship burials. In the shadowed mists of the north, where the sea caresses the land and the echoes of the past whisper with the force of the gale, the Viking ship burials stand as a monumental legacy of the Norsemen. This venerable tradition, flourishing from the 8th to the 11th centuries across the Nordic lands and beyond, embodies the essence of the Viking spirit, a testament to their profound bond with the sea, their unwavering belief in the afterlife, and their pursuit of honor beyond the mortal coil. The genesis of this ritual lies deep within the Norse cosmology, a belief system where the fabric of life and the afterlife is interwoven with the elements, and the ship, an unparalleled symbol of Viking ingenuity and exploration, serves as the chariot to the realms beyond. The discovery of the Oseberg ship in Norway's soil in 1904, a vessel dating back to 834 AD, unveils the grandeur of these ceremonies. Within its wooden embrace lay two women of noble lineage, their earthly journey concluded amidst a trove of artifacts and symbols of power, suggesting a ceremony that transcended mere burial, a rite of passage into mythology itself. The meticulous orchestration of the ship burial ritual reflects the societal values and spiritual beliefs of the Vikings. The Gokstad ship, unearthed in 1880 near Sandefjord, Norway, and dating to the late 9th century, cradled the remains of a distinguished warrior surrounded by his weapons, horses, and even ships, ready to sail him into the afterlife. These practices were not merely funerary, they were a celebration of the deceased's life, a testament to their valor, and a physical manifestation of their journey to the afterlife, believed to be overseen by the gods themselves. Among the sagas and the lore, the practice of setting ablaze a ship and sending it adrift as a funeral pyre captures the imagination a vivid imagery that has become synonymous with Viking funeral rites. While archaeological evidence for such practices is rare, the account of the death of Balder, Odin's son, in the Icelandic Eddas, where his body is placed on his ship Hringhorni, set aflame and pushed out to sea, encapsulates the poetic nature of Norse funerary customs, blending myth with the elemental forces of fire and water. The Vikings' reach extended far beyond the fjords of Scandinavia, leaving traces of their burial traditions across the lands they touched. The presence of ship burials in places like Scotland and the Isle of Man attests to the cultural exchange between the Vikings and the peoples of the British Isles. The Scarboat burial on Orkney, Scotland, dating to the 10th century, with its array of Norse grave goods alongside a Viking woman, a child and a man, illustrates the widespread influence of Viking customs, even in death. Central to the Viking ship burials is not just the ritual itself, but the individuals it honored, warriors, seafarers, and significantly, powerful women. The Oseberg burial, with its opulent grave goods and the prominence of the women it entombed, challenges modern perceptions of Viking society, revealing a complex social structure where women could hold considerable status and power. These burials narrate stories of a past where the sea was a pathway not just to conquest and exploration, but to the very heart of the divine. The legacy of Viking ship burials, a fusion of art, spirituality and maritime prowess, continues to captivate and enlighten. Through the meticulous work of archaeologists and historians, each excavation peels back the layers of time revealing more about the lives of those who lived with the rhythm of the oars and the call of the sea. In these ancient rites, we glimpse the universal quest for meaning in death and the desire to immortalize the journey of the soul. Thus, the Viking ship burials stand as a profound emblem of a bygone era, an era where the line between the earth and the ethereal was navigated with ships of oak under sails billowing with the winds of legend carrying the Norsemen from the fjords of their mortal existence to the harbours of eternity. In the words of an old Norse proverb, the brave man well shall fight and win, 
though dull his blade may be. Shadows on the crossroads, a grim spectacle of gibbeting. In the annals of punitive justice, few practices evoke the macabre tableau of gibbeting, a method where the bodies of executed criminals were displayed in metal cages for public view. This spectacle, rooted in the belief of its efficacy as a deterrent against crime, casts a long shadow over the history of criminal punishment, reaching its zenith in England during the 18th and early 19th centuries. Gibbeting, also known as hanging in chains, was not just a method of punishment, but a societal ritual, imbued with layers of social and psychological implications that mirrored the era's complex relationship with law, order and morality. The practice of gibbeting was reserved for the most heinous of crimes, such as murder or piracy, serving as a stark warning to any who would dare tread a similar path. The process involved hanging the convicted criminal, followed by encasing their body in a gibbet, a metal cage shaped to the human form, and suspending it at a prominent crossroads or near the scene of the crime. This was done under the auspices of the Murder Act of 1752, which codified the practice in England, stating that it was intended to be a further terror and a particular mark of infamy. One of the most notorious cases of gibbeting was that of William Jobling. Jobling, a miner involved in the 1832 miners' strike in Jarrow, England, was convicted of murder and gibbeted on Jarrow Slake. His body, encased in an iron cage and hoisted atop a gibbet post, served as a chilling reminder of the consequences of defying the law. Jobling's gibbet became a symbol of the harsh measures employed by authorities to quell dissent and maintain social order during a period of widespread unrest and change. The choice of location for gibbeting was strategic, designed to maximize the visibility of the spectacle and, by extension, its deterrent effect. Crossroads, being places of high traffic, were preferred, as were sites close to where the crime was committed. This ensured that the message, the fate awaiting those who broke the law, was delivered to as broad an audience as possible, embedding the memory of the spectacle in the communal consciousness. The psychological impact of gibbeting on the public was profound. The display of decaying bodies, left to swing in the air until they fell apart, was a stark visual representation of the state's power over life and death. It was intended to instill fear, not just of punishment, but of social ostracization. The criminal, in death, became an object lesson in the consequences of transgression, a physical manifestation of society's boundaries. Samuel Johnson, reflecting on the efficacy of public executions, remarked, Executions are intended to draw spectators. If they do not draw spectators, they don't answer their purpose. Yet, the effectiveness of gibbeting as a deterrent remains a subject of historical debate. While it undoubtedly left an indelible mark on the public psyche, its ability to prevent crime is less clear. Some contemporary observers noted that these gruesome spectacles might have had the opposite effect, desensitizing the public to violence and brutality, or worse, turning criminals into martyrs in the eyes of those who felt oppressed by the same system that sanctioned such punishments. The practice of gibbeting gradually fell out of favor in the 19th century, as societal attitudes towards punishment and rehabilitation began to shift. The case of James Cook in 1832, who was gibbeted near Leicester for the murder of his creditor, marks one of the last instances of gibbeting in England. The public outcry and discomfort generated by Cook's gibbeting contributed to the growing movement against the practice, leading to its abolition in England through the Anatomy Act of 1832 and the eventual decline of public execution spectacles. Echoes of the Blade, the final resting places of the guillotine's shadow. In the tempest of the French Revolution, a new spectre rose over France, its blade gleaming with the promise of equality, but stained with the blood of the condemned. The guillotine, a machine designed for the swift and egalitarian execution of justice, became a symbol of the revolution's darkest days. As it fell, heads and bodies were severed, not just from life, but from the dignity of death, leaving a trail of questions about the fates that befell them posthumously. On January 21, 1793, Louis XVI, once the sovereign ruler of France, was escorted to the Place de la Révolution, now Place de la Concorde, 
in Paris, where he faced the guillotine. His final moments were marked by a speech cut short by the drum rolls as the blade descended, severing his ties to the world. The king's body and head, like those of many guillotined, were initially interred in unmarked graves in the Madeleine Cemetery, a humble end for a monarch. In 1815, during the Bourbon Restoration, his remains were exhumed and relocated to the Basilica of Saint-Denis, the traditional burial site of French kings, in a ceremony that sought to reconcile the fractured nation with its royal past. Marie Antoinette followed her husband to the guillotine on October 16, 1793. Her final journey through Paris was marked by the scorn of the crowds, a far cry from the adulation that once greeted her. Like Louis, her remains were discreetly buried in the Madeleine Cemetery. It was only in the 19th century that her remains, too, were moved to Saint-Denis, reuniting the fallen queen with her family in death, if not in the dignity of their final moments. Her last words, Pardon me, sir, I meant not to do it, spoken to the executioner for a minor misstep, echoing the dignity with which she faced her fate. The fate of the guillotine's less noble victims varied widely. Many were buried in common graves, their bodies unceremoniously dumped and covered with lime to hasten decomposition. The cemetery of the Arancy, now lost beneath the modern streets of Paris, served as one such mass burial site where figures like Georges Danton and Camille Desmoulins were interred. These graves were not marked, their locations often forgotten, as if to erase the memory of the revolution's excesses. Among the anecdotes that punctuate the reign of terror, the story of the young and defiant Charlotte Corday stands out. Corday, who assassinated the radical journalist Jean-Paul Marat, faced the guillotine with stoic courage on July 17, 1793. Her execution, like many others, was a public affair, drawing crowds eager for the spectacle. Yet, her calm demeanour and the righteousness of her cause left an indelible mark on the public consciousness, highlighting the complexities and contradictions of the revolution. The cultural impact of these public executions cannot be overstated. They were designed as moral lessons, spectacles of the state's power over life and death, attended by crowds of Parisians who gathered to witness the final moments of the condemned. Yet, the guillotine also inspired a macabre fascination, giving birth to songs, pamphlets, and even toys in the shape of the infamous device. This public consumption of death reflected a society grappling with its own identity amidst the upheaval of revolution. Anecdotes of these times often blur the line between horror and humanity. It is told that the execution of Louis XVI was met with a stunned silence, a collective breath held by a nation as its king's life was cut short. In contrast, the execution of Robespierre, injured and broken, was met with jeers and celebration, a grim indicator of his fall from revolutionary grace. This period's public fascination with death is encapsulated in the words of Madame Tussaud, who was tasked with making death masks of the executed. She said, I have seen the heads of all the friends I had in the world fall into the basket. It is a sort of miracle that I am still alive. Madame Roland, a political figure and another victim of the guillotine, famously exclaimed, O oh, liberty, what crimes are committed in thy name? Before her execution on November 8th, 1793. Her words encapsulate the tragic irony of the revolution, a quest for liberty that spiralled into a cycle of violence and retribution. Tracks of Sorrow, the journey of the Lincoln funeral, train and beyond. In the annals of history, few events have harnessed the collective grief of a nation quite like the assassination of Abraham Lincoln on April 14, 1865. In the days that followed, a nation already wearied by the Civil War found itself plunged into mourning. The decision to transport Lincoln's body from Washington, D.C. to his final resting place in Springfield, Illinois, via a funeral train, marked not only the nation's grief, but also underscored the pivotal role railroads played in the cultural and memorial practices of the time. The Lincoln funeral train embarked on its solemn journey on April 21, 1865, transforming the very tracks it traversed into ribbons of mourning that stretched across the heartland of America. This unprecedented event saw thousands of Americans lining the tracks, 
towns and cities draped in black bunting and people paying their respects in a collective outpouring of grief. The train, adorned with black crepe and portraits of the fallen president, became a moving monument, a tangible expression of the nation's sorrow. The route of the funeral train was meticulously planned, covering approximately 1,654 miles and passing through 180 cities across seven states. At significant stops like Philadelphia, New York and Chicago, Lincoln's body was taken off the train and placed in state capitals or city halls, allowing hundreds of thousands of mourners to pay their respects. It was a logistical feat, unprecedented for its time, leveraging the railroad's capability to unite disparate parts of a fractured nation in mourning. The Lincoln funeral train was not merely a means of transport, it was a mobile site of mourning and memorialization, symbolizing the depth of the nation's loss. It also reflected the emerging role of railroads in American life, not just as engines of commerce and connectors of distant communities, but as carriers of collective memory and emotion. The image of the train, winding its way through the American landscape, brought the reality of Lincoln's death into the heart of the nation, making the grief both personal and shared. Notably, the Lincoln funeral train also carried the body of Willie Lincoln, the president's young son, who had died in the White House three years earlier. His body was exhumed and placed aboard the train to be reburied with his father in Springfield, adding a layer of personal tragedy to the public mourning. The journey itself was filled with poignant moments and vivid scenes that have etched themselves into the fabric of American history. In Baltimore, a city with divided loyalties during the Civil War, an immense crowd gathered in silence, their presence a powerful testament to Lincoln's legacy of unity. In Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, despite a torrential downpour, thousands stood in the mud for hours, waiting for a chance to view the president's coffin. These scenes of solemn unity and respect highlighted the train's role in facilitating a shared space for public mourning. A quote from the New York Herald, dated April 25, 1865, reflects the mood of the nation. No event has ever deeply moved the soul of the nation like the death of Abraham Lincoln. The funeral train not only highlighted the significance of railroads in American life, but also demonstrated their capacity to unify a nation across vast distances. In the years that followed, funeral trains became a revered tradition for commemorating distinguished figures, a practice that continued into the 20th century, with the funeral trains of Presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt and Dwight D. Eisenhower, among others. Yet none would capture the imagination or the heart of the nation quite like Lincoln's. As we delve into the echoes of the past, exploring the varied and profound ways humanity has honored the deceased, from the valorous gladiators of ancient Rome to the poignant post-mortem photography of the Victorian era, we are reminded of the ever-evolving relationship between the living and the departed. And as we bid farewell to the tales of those who have come before us, let us remember the words of the Roman philosopher Seneca, the day which we fear as our last is but the birthday of eternity. It is in the reflection upon death that life finds its most profound meaning, and in the honoring of those we have lost, that we find our deepest connections to our past, our cultures, and to the human experience itself. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the annals of history, exploring the final farewells of those who have left their mark upon the world. Until next time, may we all continue to cherish the stories that unite us across time and space, in life and in death.